Probably. As you know, I often described as a space artist, but I've done as, at least as much science fiction artist, if not more. One question I'm often asked is, how did you get started doing all this? The indication being, I suppose, why did I become interested in all this weird stuff instead of wanting to be a footballer or engine driver or, as most boys about my age did in those days. So here's the answer before you ask. When you see the influences that surrounded me and all came together when I was about 14, I think you'll agree it would be surprising if I'd done anything else really. But I'd like to try, to try and show you how exciting it all seemed at the time. This, uh, this show is made with keynotes, Apple's version of PowerPoint, which of course is better. <laughs> <laughs> but I like having a bit of fun with its transitions and, and stuff, as you'll see. I did work purely as a scientific and astronomical artist from about 1954, when I last made my first book for Patrick Moore. It was around 1970, just as men were landing on the moon on a regular basis, and fiction became fact. So I started doing FF covers and art as well. In fact, it's probably the moon that started it all in many ways because my parents bought me a set of encyclopedias, news, pictorial knowledge. As a quite a young boy, I don't know how they afforded it, but it contained articles about uh, everything, history, geography, geology, and astronomy. And I was fascinated by photographs of uh, Saturn's rings and the moon's craters. Ah. <laughs> One. Photo, as I remember, is the one at the top. Um, not a very accurate one of the lunar craters, but I loved looking at it <coughs> at the time, it was just so mysterious. Then, in my local library, I found a, a dusty copy of the 1874 book by Naismith and Carpenter called The Moon, which James Naismith had made, pl made plaster models and photographed them against a black, starry background. In the 1940s, Scrim and Bolton did the same sort of thing, often for the Illustrated London News which I came across in the Birmingham Reference Library. For my 14th birthday, my grandma gave me a book called Flights into the Future, with contributions by people like Professor A. M. Lowe, yeah. an excerpt from Jules Verne's From Earth and Moon and a trip round it. <laughs> How can I not be inspired by this and all the illustrations of, of this one? <laughs> That's why an artist called Nat Long, I think mean, was just a general sort of illustrator, but, um, I knew even then that the sky shouldn't be blue. <laughs> but I wasn't sure about those craters either. <laughs> what a place to land. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but the lunar spaceship used throughout this book was based on the British International Society's 1939 cellular spaceship, which consisted of six stages, each containing banks of solid fuel rockets. Very much like the space shuttle's external boosters, really, and we all know how unwise, unwise they can be. A year or so later, I got asked to see interplanetary flights out of the library. And they had brought it, even though it was pretty dry and technical. They had a diagram of the PIS design, which I also painted for them in 1965, as in the top picture there. But it contained many features later, later adopted by Apollo, like retractable landing legs. It was also updated in a liquid fuel version by the PIS artist and engineer R.A. Smith, Rolf Smith. For Arthur's The Exploration of Space in 1942. But around the same time, I found the artist who would inspire me even more, Jeffrey Bonnerstone. In my local library, I came across and then bought for 25 whole shillings his 1950 book, with this day, The Conquest of Space. I was knocked out by this wonderfully realistic oil painting of the moon with, the, with its tall, jagged mountains, shiny, streamlined winged spaceships and the landscapes of planets. I took his book to show my art teacher, Mr. Wolberg, at grammar school, who had already encouraged my imagination, and he said, well, they're photographs, aren't they? <laughs> I thought they only have to be to those <laughs> To which he replied, well, if you want to paint like that, you'll just have to work at it. <laughs> you need lots of patience, too. Well, I did want to, so here I am. <laughs> but I still clearly influenced a lot of other artists, too, as you can see, when people like the late Mel Hunter and Jack Collins painted the moon for books and SF covers. And of course, the moon isn't really like that, which is a pity. We'll come back to that in a moment. Another interest and influence upon me at that time was the movie that was coming out. I saw Rocket Ship XM, which cheated by using stock, stock footage of a V2 for its launch sequence, 
and was waiting 10 days for the destination moon to the cinemas. And shortly afterwards, George Powell's destination moon, which took two years to make, and for which the backgrounds were produced by none other, none other than Chilton Bonnestell. What about SF? Well, I read some science fiction, although I didn't know it was SF at the time. My library had H.G. Wells' his first thing in the moon, and a time machine, and his short stories. In 1951, my parents and I went to Blackpool for a whole day, and I walked down the road from our boarding house, and found a new landings, and they had a shelf of SF paperbacks and magazines, what we now call pulps. I bought two, one of which was Seven to the Moon, by Lee Stanton, an author of about whom I've been up to find absolutely nothing, except that he also wrote, wrote Mushroom Men from Mars. <laughs> the Seven consisted of five men and two women, which I suppose was pretty uh, emancipated for its time. But look at that so cover of uh, Flies Into Space. And especially the back cover. I'll give you a moment to read that. Mm. <laughs> you notice the space travel was just around the corner. <laughs> so from that time on, I thought magazines went out of the way I could. Usually I found find them British ones like Authentic and New Worlds. But later also reprints of the US Astounding Galaxy and Worlds of If. Sometimes the cover art was mind-bogglingly good, but I have to admit that sometimes I thought, what if I could do better than that? Most of this stuff was also featured from time to time, cover art by Chelsea Bonnestell, even though he always insisted that he didn't do SF, he was an astronomical artist. As a matter of fact, that scene of somebody we know will probably live to see on the back cover of Flight Into Space is from Destination Moon. You can see the spaceship Luna up in the distance there. On the right, in the other one, um, on, and the one at the foot clearly owes, so the, the, this one also clearly owes um, a lot to it too. There's a wonderful continuous shot in that film which consists entirely of one Bonnestell panoramic painting, L shaped, so that we panel on the horizon, past the sun and the earth and then down to the very foot of the rockies. Hard to see it. Is it? Yeah. This is actually made from the original panorama, but it doesn't come down to the foot of the rockies. That part of the paper got lost. Smith. 
And as you can see, it was copied <coughs> exactly from the cover of the Disney Science Fiction, number 39. The artist is credited as just Davis. Another artist used by Authentic was Richards. They never seem to have first names. So I've, I've, I've since then learned that they were all in fact made by John Richards. For copyright five reasons, he had to use two names. Strange colours though, aren't they? And that hasn't been faded in the sun or anything either. I produced my own little scene in 1954. You'll see why in a moment. I used Smith's design for the Ferry Rockies, although it had a slightly larger wings. And, um, but I used Ron Brown's design for the, the space station. Which I, which I prefer. It has a, a solid, a solid collector around its rim. And in the distance, the dumbbell shaped spaceship designed by Clark for going further out into space, say to Mars, which is nuclear powered, with one sphere containing fuel connected by a long tube to the other smaller one for the crew. However, my own first work was only a couple of years before that. The first time I ever saw Mark work in print <coughs> was when I had written the Birmingham Evening Dispatch pointing out to scientific impossibility in their flash board and comic strip. I suppose they must have been sure of news because they phoned and then a reporter came round to my house and interviewed me. The article appeared in the, on the 16th of April 1952, just a few days after my 16th birthday. Of course it was a nine day wonder amongst my friends and neighbours and then the not altogether welcome nickname of Flash for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a unique experience to see my work reproduced in black and white, and I was keen to see more of my work in print. The chance came in 1954 when I was asked to illustrate Sons, Myths and Men by Patrick Moore. The only problem was that I had to produce eight illustrations in five days before joining the RAF for National Service. Which <laughs> <laughs> has been a story of my life in the century. <coughs> I used straightboard which is scratching away the black inhaling surface to reveal a layer of white pipe clay underneath. This was easier to use than paint when you're sitting on a bed in your village, as I did while I was in the area. Honestly, I was very keen on painting the moon illuminated by a blue green earth light, often with the sun rising on distant mountains on a crater wall. So I wasn't, it wasn't surprising that I enjoyed painting the same kind of scene. Note that I'm using the Larry Smith design for the Lunar Lander. These were paint, all painted in 1954. I was, while I was in the RAF, for a book with Patrick to be called The Challenge of the Stars, which was intended to be a sort of British version of the Monastery and Lake Conference of Space. But sadly, it never got published at the time. The publisher said it was too speculative. But this is how we really thought space travel would develop in those days. Go to the space station in orbit, go to the moon, build a base on the moon, go on to Mars, all manned of course. I guess we just go to show that, as Patrick Moore used to say, we just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I said earlier that most of those paintings by SF artists and, and others of the moon were wrong. It's worth pointing out that Stephen Bonnestall should have known better than to believe that because there's no atmosphere on the moon, its mountains will be sharp and craggy. Sure, there's been no water, weather, or erosion such as we see, we see on the Earth, but there has been erosion of different <coughs> time, eons of micrometeorites raining down, as well as extreme contrast in temperature between day and night, light and shade. The French astronomer and artist, Lucien Rudeau, knew this, and had published a book containing his lovely and very accurate paintings in 1937, Sur les autres mondes, on other worlds. Some of which look almost like Apollo photographs. I think Bonnestall simply preferred his dramatic version, and from a purely pictorial point of view, so do I. At the top is an example, an example of an artist working from a photograph. Photos and films of Apollo launches always show the rocket flame as a blinding white, but this was because the, the film emulsion in those days just couldn't cope with the amount of UV that was emitted. It wasn't until I saw the Apollo 15 launch myself in 1971 that I discovered that the flame was a gorgeous orange colour caused by unburned fuel burning up in atmospheric oxygen. Apollo 15, of course, carried the first lunar rover, which was stationary in the days forever, unless one day someone from the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., brings it back, for they had all the artifacts left on the moon. 
or if someone else goes in to take a ride on it. <laughs> well, Ben, the AGN, is often referred to as a little green man since he first appeared on the cover of the magazine of Anthony Science Fiction in 1975. But if you compare him with the NASA hardware he's sitting on, he's about two and a half metres, nearly eight foot tall. Oh yes, those rocks in the foreground remind me of something. It seems to be a good moment to include a bit of, uh, well, SF history, I suppose. Even before the Apollo landing, I began to paint the moon with rounded mountains and a rolling eroded landscape. And my friend Roger Payton, I'm sure quite a lot of you know, commented jokingly that all my rocks look like marshmallows. <laughs> Naturally stung by this, I slurred on my, my attempt to be accurate. For the next convention, I produced a painting with the sharpest, most jagged rocks that I could paint. And entitled it Marshmallow Moon, with a question mark. <laughs> the joke's on like that because it has proved one of the most successful paintings I've ever done, and it's appeared on several books, SF covers, and sideways and prints. So let's take a look at the rest of the planets in the solar system and how they've changed over the years. This diagram shows our current knowledge, but I would have, it would have been very different in the 1950s. The only ringed planet then was Saturn with three rings and nine satellites. Now it has thousands of rings and over 60 moons, while all of the outer gas planets, are, gas planet planets, gas giant planets, sorry, have systems of rings and dozens of moons. Pluto will now be counted as a planet, it's a dwarf planet, and rather than one planet X being out beyond Pluto, the whole lot of bodies of equal size and bigger out there known as carbon belt objects. So let's have a quick look at each planet in turn, starting in traditional fashion with the closest to the sun. Mercury is the closest to the sun and the, and the smallest. For many years it was quite common for science fiction stories set on Mercury to be picked with a ton tolerable twilight zone between its day and night sides. One being hot enough to melt lead, you know, quite possibly the coldest place in the solar system because it was somewhere the sun never shines, to quite a phrase. <laughs> then in the 1960s, radar measurements showed that instead of its day being the same length of this year, 88 of our days, it actually rotates in 59 days with a strange tide locked rotation of two thirds of a Mercurian Merc 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 year, or 59 days. Honest still did get one thing right, though, it had been portraying Mercury for years as being very moon-like with craters. And the first first of the images from Mariner 10 in 1974 showed this to be the case. Some of the photos look just like the moon, although there are other unique features too, including signs of volcanic activity. The messenger probe was supposed to go there into orbit a few years ago. This is where we first, well, no, we've actually I've not moved on from there. Um, it's the second time we see Ben, the, um, the benevolent devil of our monster, where he isn't one really. He's, he's a sort of interplanetary hobo who's just home in airless space, as, as in any planetary atmospheres. And he always makes unorthodox use of some piece of natural hardware. Here he sunbathes on one of the solar panels of Mariner 10 under a blazing sun that's three times bigger than we see it. You'll probably see it again. Mars may have had canals and intelligent margin, but Venus has probably changed even more over the years. In the 1950s, there were two or three main possibilities. Many as authors prefer the sort of Jurassic swamp, but it could be a wind-blown dust desert with rocks eroded into strange shapes, or there could be planet-wide planet -wide oceans which would, look, which would be made of soda water because they did contain dissolved of carbon dioxide. Then in the 70s, a number of probes showed just how hostile it really is. In the 1970s, the Czech artist, Jurek Peshek, who also wrote this here, showed him volcanic vents and glowing lava. He painted in a looser and more impressionistic style than most of the surprise space artists, almost as if he sat there with his easel and paints, but said, not on Venus or anything. <laughs> Venus has been called a hell planet, and that's certainly true. It's not a place for a tourist vacation spot with temperatures like an oven and sulfuric acid rain. This hasn't stopped some SF orders like Ben Bova from giving it life forms high in its atmosphere. Of course, when I did the top picture, I was painting mainly in gouache of all the critics, occasionally in oils. 
In the 1986 I got my first computer, an Atari 520ST, with 512K of RAM. Yes. <laughs> I moved to a very particular Atari's until 1991, where I got my first Apple Power Mac with 512 reg megabytes of RAM. This is the first of many digital illustrations to follow from, from, from the latest book I did with Patrick called Fugis, 50 Years in Space, which is subtitled The Challenge of Stars, because it celebrates the 50 years since we first worked together on a book with that title. And it shows the changes in astronomy in space that have taken place in that time, like in 1954, as I said before, we used to think we'd have base on the moon and Mars by now. We never believed that we'd live in 1972 and we'd have gone back by 2016. Moving out to Mars, right until 1976, when the Viking landings arrived, everyone expected the sky to be dark blue because the little red planet was known to have a thin atmosphere. It was in 1877 that the Italian astronomer Schiaparelli claimed to have observed thin, straight lines, which he called Canali, meaning channels, which got mistranslated as canals. Christopher Noel took this as a stage further by stating that these must be evidence of a marking civilization. The top left is Bruno's view of Mars from the case of Moon Dimos from 1937. There are hints of canals, and as an observer, he showed the yellow clouds and trilemmas of the dust storms. Bonnestell's painting of the arrival of a Mars expedition from 1956 definitely shows canals, while my 1954 painting of the left shows vegetation growing over the dry water watercourse and the blue sky, of course. The top left is a colour from Astronomy Nano, Astronomy Nano magazine showing Mars through the ages. At the top is Hyman's first sketch, now in 1659, it shows a Beautiful for the Circus Major. Then one of Percival Lowell's drawings from around 1900, a typical, a typical telescopic colour photo. Mario Paul in 1965 in black and white. And finally a wonderful composite from the Viking Orbiter. The inset at the bottom left shows H.G. Wells' fighting machines from his 1896 War of the Worlds, which was inspired of course, by, um, by the old Martians and their canals. As we know, this became just the first of many stories, novels and films featuring invasions of the Earth of various creatures. And of course, <coughs> it was revived as a film as recently as 2005. The top right is my first call for Anna magazine from June 1981, showing how an expedition could reach Mars in 1995. <coughs> Using existing NASA hardware and each of the space labs living quarters. The lower picture shows another science fictional favourite, the terraform Mars, making it Earth like. I think the term was first used by Jack Williamson in 1949 in his novel CT Shock, with the idea of a spot around long before then. In 1994, Arthur C. Clarke was publishing his book, The Snows of Olympus and asked me if he could use the bottom picture as its cover. In the same year, Carl Sagan asked me for some illustrations to go inside his pale blue dot. But then, just in time, I discovered that he was intending to use the same painting as his cover, which wouldn't be a good idea. But I suggested he might use this later version, in which Mars has oceans, the ocean, Oceanus Borealis. You probably noticed that my own painting so far has formed between 1954, give or take a year or so, when I was working on the aborted challenge of the stars, and 2004, when Futures was published. In, in 1972, Patrick and I finally got the chance to know that men had landed on the moon, for the last time, as it turns out, and we sent probes to several of the planets to publish a book with that title. For this, I painted this scene of the, of the Martian pole at the top, top right, with a dark blue sky. In 1978, coinciding with the release of Star Wars, a revised edition, the New Challenge of the Stars, a definitive title, was published, which of course was after the Viking Landings, so for this I ever the sky of Kukana. For Futures, which as I said basically updates the 70s Challenge of the Stars, I did this digital scene of Mars exploration, showing the Mars rover which incorporates a mobile laboratory that has robotic arms to pick up larger samples. 
from groups into the Dutchie Ben as its mascot too. I think the little one is asking for the, uh, the Green Party to, be sco to discover him. The very first Ben cover I had for MSF was this one in November 1975, which of course was before the Viking landings. Carl Sagan bought the original, but Nigel Robson, who some of you might know, used to go to comms, bought one of the later ones and then asked me to do a new one directly from the Viking results. His version looked like this. Since my first pen cover, showing on the Viking land, it was in 1975, 2015 was his 40th anniversary. To celebrate this, FNSF published this new cover, the first pen one done digitally, within this behaving as usual, and he says Exo Mars Rover, failing once again to spot him. <laughs> well, I think I want to say this, the picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah. <laughs> Moving outwards from the sun, we come next to the asteroid belt. As an artist, I can understand why virtually every film or documentary about space shows this as being crowded with chunks of rock hurtling around and colliding with each other like they can do the surface. All very exciting. Unfortunately, it just doesn't look like that. The scene at the top left is from Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. If it was accurate, it would look more like this. <laughs> You'd be lucky to see one asteroid from another, but the second time is a moving star. Sure, there are thousands of these bodies out there, varying in size from flying mountains to tiny planets like Sirius, nearly a thousand kilometers across. The space is big, very big, as some people understand. <laughs> Even so, we know there are Apollo asteroids which will spread outside the main belts and approach the Earth. And one very large one, like the one that um, probably wiped out the dinosaurs, will strike the Earth. Imagine the damage it will do if it hits an inhabited area as here. Deep impacts and Armageddon were huge, while others like Meteor are probably best forgotten. <laughs> Other Apollo asteroids trace so far that they approach the Sun, like Icarus, which uh, glows red at its closest approach. That actual painting is almost three dimensional, it's, it's got a, a, a relief to it because I'm extra cast. Life in the cloud of Jupiter, in a relatively temperate zone between the heat from the core and the freezing outer atmosphere, is treated in a number of times in SF, perhaps the most notable being a meeting with Medusa by C. Clark. But um, in their own Jack Cohen and Ian Stewart have taken a stab at quite a good one actually in Wheelers. Carl Sagan is also an advocate. He would see floaters and mantle like hunters, predators. In the painting of the Rory, Constant lighting clear splashes can be seen on the yellow of his IO, which we'll come to in a moment. The painting of Jupiter from IO at the top right is the first one I was happy with as a painting when I was 16. I have to admit that the big ice formation bears a resemblance to one of Scott's photographs from the Antarctic, but you have to get any references where you can find them, don't you? The one at the bottom left is from the 1972 challenge. And at that time, they still didn't know how flat Europa is. For many years, all the textbooks said that Jupiter has 11 satellites. With the advent of spacecrafts, I lost counts because it seems to go up almost daily. But that's the number I heard was 67, I think. Of course, most of these are simply captured asteroids, which is no surprise since the giant planet with its huge gravitational field is so close to the asteroid belt. The major or Galilean satellites, so called because Galileo discovered them, Europe has always attracted attention because of its high albedo, its bright. So Bonnestel painted it covered in ice in the 50s, and so did I in the, in the 1972 for the challenge. The probes from Voyager onwards showed it to be very flat, but covered in cracks, no mountains and few craters, suggesting that its, few, its surface is pretty recent. The most exciting suggestion is that below the ice is a salty ocean, 
and that because of these gravitational stresses producing heat, they could even be on the sea volcanoes like Adrat smokers, and therefore just maybe life. Not surprising, this is proof of Brian's father for SF being bent over again for the one of the best writers to see the comments. But the most accurately volcanic body in the solar system is Io, which has been described as looking like a giant pizza. It's constantly turning itself inside out. It was during the voyage of one passenger, March 1979, that an enormous crescent was first noticed behind the limb of Io. It was a parasol like plume of a volcano. Over 200 caldeiras had now been identified, and rather than being cold volcanoes powered by sulfur, as we thought, they were extremely hot. One of Ronestel's best known papers from his 1944 Life series is the Mimas from Mimas. Then believed to be the closest satellite, the view of Saturn looked be staggering. You have to fling your arms wide to and encompass it. Note that the rings are age on, but they can cast a strong shadow on the planet. The bottom left, Lucian Rudo, shows the rings of Saturn from a high latitude within the atmosphere above the cloud layers. The shadow of the planet takes a bite out of the my digital version of the future shows the, shows the impact crater Herschel. The asteroid that caused that must have almost split the little moon wide open. Like Mars and Venus, Titan has passed through many transformations over the years. Because it was known to have an atmosphere, it was usually depicted with a blue sky, as in this 1960s painting by Bonnestel. My research for Challenge of the Stars in 1972, I asked some scientists at Berlin University, showed that methane in quantity is in, is in fact greenish. But for the 1978 new challenge, while keeping the same basic composition, I used Carl Sagan's theory of ice volcanoes, which replenished the atmosphere, launching out hydrogen and the lava of methane and water. Interestingly, this theory has now been revived as a result of the preceding Huygens data, and there almost certainly are ice volcanoes there. Astronomy now commissioned this painting as a cover a few years ago. One of the main points of interest about the Apisus, from which Saturn looks about as big as the Earth does from the Moon, is it's the only satellite from which Saturn can be seen with its rings quite wide open, or the other being in the plane of the rings. But the other one is that one side is dark and the other side is bright, not just because the sun is shining on the It used to be thought this is due to ice overlaying dark rock, which now believe is either dark organic material oozing up from below the ice, or more probably being deposited from space, perhaps from another moon. The Apisus Pinching Clark's 2001 Space Odyssey, the book version, is, in which the discovery makes a Saturn rather than to Jupiter, as it did in the film. As an aside on space life, I still did sometimes work with photographs and models rather like Naismith or if you paint over them. This is quite similar in a way to the way in which some of today's artists use digital methods just to rain generators and then continue in Photoshop, the writing on the right. But he was not averse to reusing these models, as you can see from this 1964 painting of the red supergiant Antares from beyond the solar system. You can see that landscape's just the same in the background here from here. Then he should arrive in the dish of Pioneer 11. When this appeared on FNSF, I got a letter from one of the team at JPL asking if they could have a print of it. He said that Ben could, sorry, he said that Ben could explain some of the strange results they've been getting. I did a painting of Uranus at the top for my first big exhibition at the London Zone Temple in 1968. There's quite a story about Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones came to buy it, but uh, probably isn't on there, you can ask him later. Very <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, Uranus, Uranus is a very strange world and its axis is inclined by 98 degrees. So it sort of rolls along its orbit rather than spinning up right like a top, as most planets do, except for Pluto, of course. I showed a lake of frozen methane, but the big surprise of Voyager's missions was these 12 mile high ice cliffs from Miranda, a little one that looks like it's been broken apart and reassembled. <coughs> of course, Ben's been there to build a snow bin. I was at JPL in Pasadena in 1989 when the images came in from Voyager 2 as it flew by Neptune in its big moon and Triton. The first surprise was a great black spot on Neptune, rather by the red spot on Jupiter, 
And the next was a strange dark sphinx on the pinkish methane <coughs> of the Gaza, which turned out to be caused by visas and prizes. This impression of the visas is from Fugius, and I've shown the dark material falling from the streamers of gas. I also painted the small amounts of satellite near it at the bottom, and from here you can see the ring of the good angle. Although the new moon is being discovered all the time, you can say which is really the inner one or the outermost. The smaller ones are most likely just captured carbon belt objects from the belt of snowballs at the edge of our solar system from which some comets come. Oh yes, uh, Ben has been to Triton as well, using, his, his, using the gators for a shooting gallery. In August 2006, a meeting of the International Astronomical Union, or AAU, decreed that Pluto was a planet dwarf planet. Certainly its orbit is very eccentric, and it has, it has a close satellite, Charon, which the Americans call Sharon, <laughs> which is so large relative to Pluto that it could not could what be called a double planet. That's called the Earth Moon system, I suppose. There are several smaller moons, but didn't even know of the planet of the rise that Pluto has a moon. I think the best SF novel I've read on Pluto, set on Pluto, is Kim Stanley Robinson's Ice Hinge. So here's my painting of uh, Pluto and Chiron from Futures, showing the temporary atmosphere with, which appears when it's at its closest to the Sun, or perihelion. Of course, in July 2015, the New Horizons probe sent back the most amazing pictures, and I was surprised and pleased to see that the painting I did in 1991 turned out to be remarkably accurate. But Chiron does have huge crevasses across its surface. And on Pluto is a plane, now known as Sputnik Plane. And that brings us almost to the end of our solar system. But there are other bodies out there. Here we are, that's, there's uh, the Pluto and Chiron picture with, uh, with the New Horizons being added with a 3D model made by my friend uh, Dr. Dan Lerner. As I was saying, there are other bodies out there, like Sedna, which is just an anagram of Andes anyway. Quite a lot of the Xena, and they're probably just carbon belt objects, as indeed is Pluto, really. On the left is how I imagine Quaidor, and the other at the top right is a binary. Comets come from the Oort cloud, lumps of ice and rock at the, at the bottom right. They become perturbed by various planets, but especially Jupiter, and release their tails only when they reach the inner part of the system and are heated by the sun. These are all done by the star at night. I'm not aware of anyone's with the soil around these yet, does anybody know me? Anyway, that, that completes our tour of the solar system. Mm. Here's a painting of a red dwarf star painted in acrylics back, back around 1989, Proxima Centauri. It's just over four, four light years from us, and only about a fiftieth as bright as our sun. Although it's a flare star, and can suddenly blaze up to double, more, more, double its brightness. And have liquid water, as here, any planet would need to be to orbit in about 10 to 12 days. At the upper right are the two main stars of our Alpha Centauri, A and B. Well, I could go on showing you paintings of stars, galaxies, nebulae, pulsars, black holes, exoplanets, and all sorts of phenomena about the place, out of space, but uh, I said I was going to show you some of my science fiction art, so I need to move on. But here's a lot of science fictional view from futures of the galaxy, the galaxy in which we live, the Milky Way. It's a dark spiral containing some 200 or 300 billion stars. Our own star is in the Cygnus Orion arm. It's positioned somewhere around there. But this is that. Anyway, this is from, uh, from an inhabited planet in a stray star, 200,000 light years out, outside the galaxy. I think at this point I can include a bit of background on how I got into this business. As I've said so far, I've between 1954, when I was in the RAF, and worked on the original Channel of the Stars, and 2004, when Futures was published. Having been equally good at science and arts at school, I had worked in the laboratory when I left school at 16. But having had a taste of working as illustrator on Patrick Sun, Myths and Men, in 1954, I decided to try for an artistic career instead when I came to the RAF. I lived in Bourneville, so I got the job at Cadbury's initially in the sales office while waiting for the vacancy in the studio. And that taught me a lot about keeping accounts, measures, making invoices and so on, which came in handy when I went freelance. I did eventually move into the design office where I did the actual artwork that was used on, yes, chocolate boxes. 
and Bibles of all sorts. Find them a chance to do a bit of fantasy. Mm-hmm. 1959 was the year I went to my first con, Broncon, at the Imperial Hotel in Temple Street in Birmingham. That's my friend uh, Peter Hamilton with me. Sadly, none of them with us, but um, it was also the year in which I got my Triumph 21 motorbike. And Kathy and I had a group of friends who were all bikers like myself, and we used to go out for rides together and so on. Quite a decent bunch, as you can see from the photo. You can now ride your bikes here if you find a few cats and two passes at once on the right there. Uh, and a few of us still meet up every, every few weeks and go out for a meal. But within a year of my leaving Cambridge to go freelance in 1965, they all left for better jobs. It didn't change us a bit though. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a fancy dress party for the long nights of the 21st, I think. <coughs> but because I was in Norfolk between 1967 and 73, I missed what was going on back in Birmingham, the formation of the Rob Group and the first couple of Nova Funds. So how did I start doing science fiction arts? Well, by, 70, by 1970, I was living in Norfolk, as I said. So several th- interesting things happened that year. My first convention with Chrome Chrome was on the 6th of there. And it's in, in 1959, and there I am again with, the, with my friend Pete Anderson. I was walk behind us, there were some plays by Eddie Jones, and I think possibly Mel Collins for all the That's what they did in those days. They didn't have a special the separate art show. They were just Custom things all over the walls in the con room. Anyway, in 1970, I went to SciCon, the East of Convention in London. Didn't have an art show either, but uh, the Portal Gallery got an exhibition of science fiction arts in conjunction with the con. I produced a large critic painting from the scene on Saturn's Moon Titan, but I added a couple of astronauts gave me to view because of the Sphinx of Giza sitting in a lake of liquid methane, actually infected with the first SFRs I've done, we've seen by the public. I sent the first volume on slide of it to Ed Furman, the editor of uh, the publisher of the magazine about the science fiction, like an SF, in America, mainly because I knew the magazine used the most astronomical covers by W. Marsfield. He said he'd use it if I could do a vertical version, which I probably did. It appeared in June 1971. It became the first of over 70 covers from their own for SF. But by that time, Vision, SF magazine Vision Tomorrow had appeared, and Vision my work on his, on his very first covers, including these two. One for a story, and another one, a vertical version of the painting I've done of Jupiter from Europa for the space encyclopedia. After that, there was a series of articles on each of the planets for the back cover, at least the one that was in the magazine last year. But they, those were my first published non fiction writing. Also, my first Fine Art Prince, Stellar Aliens, was published. It was, it was, it was voted number six in the top ten prints for 1970. This followed from my first one man exhibition of the Deep Circular Flare at the London Planetarium in 1968, which uh, which coincided with the release in London of 2001 A Space Odyssey. The Red Stellar Aliens. And the Stellar Aliens led to the biggest job I've ever done so far, in terms of sheer size anyway. A mural painted on the wall at Astor's Motel near Dorchester in Dorset. I think I'm sure. It was 24 foot long by 8 foot high, and as you can see, it was uh, another red giant star, star picture. They painted in fluorescent colours, so they glowed with its own light when the room was dark and the ultraviolet lamps were switched on behind the COVID. Unfortunately, when I went to that area many years ago, we found the hotel had been burnt to the ground. <laughs> oh. In 1972, Sidney and Jackson suggested to Patrick that it might be a good idea to do a book on the future of space travel on the lines of the Bonnestill Bay Conquest of Space, which they published over here, now that we've been to the moon and sent probes to the planet. They wanted Patrick to work with Bonnestill, who was still alive and working with Riley in 1986, not 1898. Patrick said, No, we have an English eyes now, David Riley. He recently sold a quarter of a million copies of his Moonlight Atlas. So maybe the bigger book than Susan and Jackson could afford, they linked up with Mitchell Beasley and challenged the stars' bodies on the lines of day. There was a big launch party in London, 
Hosted by three mutual law, as you say there. And then Arthur C. Clarke, who had written the foreword, came to see it at Space Age, Space Age exhibition of having a but wow, man, big those sideburns. <laughs> Is that there? <laughs> Spin-off from Channel of the Stars, where the Robson publishers wanted to use illustrations of SF covers, Sphere books are publishing a series of science fiction classics, <coughs> like they do. And it seems as Arthur has suggested to Anthony Cheetah that they use some of them on the covers of his books, like the Sands of Mars, which they did. The other thing was, they didn't choose to use Martian Vimos, which was later used on World of Vid. But my painting of for Io, and very sorry, of um, the asteroid Eros, well, Mars is there. There it is. <laughs> Jim Bain asked me if the galaxy, I can do a new version of Second of the Titan, which we will be seeing mapping the asteroid, the asteroid speaking in the foreground, and so on. I designed a logo for Gemini science fiction in Germany, too, in 1973. I came back to my home town in Birmingham in 73 and saw a card in my local library, put there by Peter Weston, advertising the Birmingham science fiction group. I went on to a meeting and very soon became a publicity officer and later secretary. I was chairman for four years, three consecutively, and I also produced a newsletter, Digiki, for the first time, which I titled The Brother Group News. I did that for four years. And of course, I saw the Southern Games Convention in Overcom regularly, putting papers in the art show, and, and I was on the committee several times. In 1974, a large format magazine, Science Fiction Monthly, was launched by the English Library, and they were desperate for artists afterwards to fill it. Again, unfortunately, they didn't care too much about the quality of the material they published and grew it up to this large size. I sent them some duplicate 35 millimeter slides, many of them from Channel of the Stars, just intended as samples of my work. I was horrified when I found that they actually printed them, but they did also use my this Skull City painting with an article about my work, and this also appeared on NEL's A Sense of Wonder collection. More than Superhuman was another cover of the Huddy for NEL. Around 1980-81, I've been writing and illustrating a series of articles on various aspects of space and space travel for my Space Voyager magazine. Chris Morgan and I have thought of trying to do a book together on UFOs. Not that we believe it, but I hasten to add. But we just think it might make an interesting book. And we then converted that into a series of articles for Space Voyager. I should perhaps also point out that in 2001, Chris wrote the text for Hardyware, the art in David A. Hardy, which contains a lot of the material in this talk. I said the print there, which you can edit on the Amazon, a bit of pen or some of them. The other major project from 1981 was a purely SF book I did with Bob Shaw, Galactic Tours. The idea was that my specially produced paintings of tourists of, on other planets would be used if they were from a travel brochure. Originally, it was to be on the next book from Mitchell, Mitchell Beasley, who asked me what I'd like to do after Challenge of the Stars. But I went to have it out by suggesting Bob instead of Patrick, and then their sales were said he wouldn't sell. And he sat on the shelf for about 18 months while we tried to find another publisher. By the time we had, some of the illustrations had appeared in an article in Starlight magazine, and other books started coming out with a similar idea. You know, sort of things, Spacecraft 2000 to 3100 AD, and even Tour of the Universe by Malcolm Edwards and Robert Holstock. So when it did come out, it just looked, looked like another one more book jumping on the bandwagon. Oh well. Occasionally, an artist who's short of time uses existing art. As I did with the, um, the, the dragons of Tabor, here's the, the towers of Tabor, here's the dragons of Tabor. If, if, you're, if you're as illustrious in 2011 used to come, at the NEC in Brom, I was the artist guest of honour, you might have got an SMS or smells to his friends, wrote a very nice bit about me. Here's a bit of input there. It seems that one of my paintings impressed Smuzz, but there's a story about that which comes right into the present day. I might add that he was right over the lava lamp still, I was his father, one of those. <laughs> but originally I was going to paint a challenge of an extra solar planet with life on it. This one. 
And we were in the middle of the club, we were just clogging the cluster, so the sky was always sort of star, and there was no light. Which was really because it was too Earth like. It's awkward, we did use, did use a square version, as the other one got it from the um, Northern Mountain Grill. But well, okay, if you want uh, an alien planet, I'll give you an alien planet. And they came up with this version, in which rats and ladders or sats grow and mature on an ocean, filling with oxygen from some form of photosynthesis, and finally maturing and floating upwards, then flying through the carbon dioxide atmosphere. But it wasn't the end of this, this story. A few years ago, a chap emailed, emailed me who had been giving galactic tours as a boy, and he'd always been fascinated by his final painting of a partially ruined gateway which led to another world, which in turn led to another, and so on. Was the original available, or could he get a print? Well, the original was actually stolen from an exhibition in Stuttgart Planetarium in 1901, along with 10 others. But I said I could do a similar painting more supply on G-Clay. The outcome was that he was able to a large G-Clay and also commissioned a new painting over a metre across. I was seen with not one, but five portals, again, partially ruined, on a deserted world with mountains, lakes and waterfalls. I put it on Facebook, also on Facebook, on a hawking page, my back door there, the Paul and Mountain Grill. Album was also put up. Of course, this cover was a squared off version of that painting of Alien Life that I showed you just now. A couple of months ago, a German, well, it's not that now, but a, a, a German guy asked via Facebook whether I could combine these two pictures. At first, I thought, no way. Then I found it in Photoshop and found it could actually work quite well. Naturally, other jobs have come along apart from book illustrations and covers. So that the challenge was published in 1973, actually, I was approached by Steve O'Rourke, who was King Floyd's manager, about doing a cover for their new album, which was only going to be called <coughs> Two or Dark Side of the Moon. I did point out there's no such thing as a dark side of the moon, really. And if you listen carefully, right at the end of the album, you can hear somebody say, there's no such thing as a dark side of the moon, really. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we all know that the cover art was for that was actually produced by hypnosis, as usual, with art by George Hardy, no relation, and it's just H A R D I E, really. The Prism and the Spectrum. As you just saw, I did album screens for other, other bands like Hawkwind, and they, and the movie Brewers and Camel, used slides in my work as part of the light shows. I worked on several film projects doing production art, but only one of them made it to the screen. Two of them which happened are Steve Silver Wars, the brainchild of Kenny Young, the musician who wrote under the boardwalk and other other hits, and Arthur C. Clarke's The Fallen Moon Cross, which I still think can make a very good movie, actually. Yeah. Some hands, some nest of colours, 